Yes. Hey, everyone. Good evening. How are you? Good. Uh, Dan Murphy is uh, one of our consultants. So I'm going to move him over. I think he's one of our consultants. Emily is certainly promote to panelist. Hey, Eddie, how are you? Hi, how are you? Dan Murphy is being promoted. Brockton Cable is being promoted. Amanda, would you like to be promoted? Sure, sounds good. All right, let's promote you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we may have some more people joining us shortly, but um, I just want to um, set up some ground rules before we kick off here tonight. Um, we are in what they call webinar presentation mode. So the panelists, those people are on the screen, have their mics um, unmuted and, and can speak at will. Um, because they are either on the board itself or the ones making the presentation um, or our gracious sponsors at uh, Mass Development. Uh, those of you who are in attendee mode, uh, when we get to a question and answer time uh, and you want to make a comment uh, at the bottom of your screen, if you hover uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raised hand, a raised hand icon and that's the way that we know that you would like to ask a question. You can also use the Q&A um, icon. Also, if you don't want to be um, uh, recorded, you can just type your message in. And then we're also going to be taking emails um, at planning at cobma.us. Um, it's my understanding from the chair that we're going to open and make a presentation and then, um, uh, give people some time to digest this information. And then at our February meeting, we will have a final vote on this action. And I don't think we'll need the consultants for that billable hours and all. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but uh, Madam Chair, if you would like to kick us off, please. Hi, right, good evening, everyone. Uh, starting the meeting for Wednesday, January 5th to read a little statement. This meeting is being recorded in accordance with the government order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 38, section 20, real time public participation and comment can be addressed to the planning board utilize, utilizing the Zoom virtual meeting software for remote access. This application will allow users to view the meeting and send a comment or question to the chair via the question and answer function submitted. Text comments will be read into record. For those of you joined by phone, press star nine. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. A copy of this recording will be on the city's webpage. I'll, they will skip the end. There's no vote tonight. We'll save that for February. Okay, um, just do a roll call for the board members. James Sweeney. Here. Larry Hassan. Here. Samantha Broyce. Here. Rita Das. Present. And Tony Gonzalez is present. Okay, Rob, the floor is yours. And um, I am Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Joining us today is Pam Gurley, uh, my administrative assistant. And um, leading the presentation is Emily Ennis of Ennis and Associates, uh, or Ennis Associates. And uh, we have been working on a master plan for the area around Good Samaritan Hospital, an area that we're now calling Lovett Brook um, for the past nine months, uh, it seems. Um, we have had a, a professional planning group working with us uh, over, the uh, over the years and, uh, or over the time, and um, uh, you know, uh, have uh, 
made a couple of public presentations. And so this is um, sort of the next hurdle in the process of, of getting it adopted as the official plan, master plan for this area. And uh, I would like to turn the presentation over to Emily, um, who should be able to share her screen and um, walk us through a quick presentation. Excellent. Well, quickish. Quickish. Thank you very much, Rob. I uh, appreciate it. Um, first of all, to all of you, Happy New Year. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, we had presented the existing conditions and some initial thoughts on this plan back in October. So it's nice to be back to you with the draft plan for your review. Um, I am going to just run through some of the work that we've done since October. And uh, I'm also joined by my colleague, Dan Murphy from Tie and Bond, who's going to talk about some of the traffic implications. And of course, Amanda Gregoire from Mass Development has been the lead person at their end, um, keeping an eye on this project. So just want to recognize that she's here as well. So with that, um, talked a little bit uh, as a reminder of the existing land uses. I'm going to talk about the development scenarios that we looked at, what it means that they're scenarios and why we have them that way, talk about some of the recommendations and then the key next steps. And you can see here the mass development team and also the consultant team, Dan and I have been joined by many people over the course of this plan. Um, you heard uh, at the presentation in October, you heard some of the market conditions that uh, RKG had assisted us with. We're not going to be talking about those today, but just wanted to call out their um, participation in this. So in terms of existing land uses, just as a reminder, this is the Lovett Brook area. Um, you can see that we're talking about, obviously, the Good Samaritan Medical Center in the middle with some other medical office buildings here in purple. We have some single family houses scattered uh, along the edge of Oak Street and then one kind of in the sort of the middle uh, western part of the site. A lot of restaurant and retail over on the northwest of the site, an office building to the east, and then the footprint of a former movie theater that had been vacant for some time before it was finally demolished. So that gives you a, a picture of the conditions. Uh, as part of the presentation in October, we looked into the existing physical conditions, um, including the uh, trans transportation and traffic conditions, uh, environmental conditions. Obviously we have Lovett Brook running through the center of the site with some wetlands present in an existed wooded area. Um, we looked at the demographics uh, initially, and this part is really talking about having understood those existing conditions, what is it possible to do with the site? We had done um, quite a bit of public outreach in terms of a three-part online survey to get initial thoughts, uh, a public meeting, and then a post-public meeting survey to get some uh, thoughts on that. So, we're now able to show you some of what we've been looking at in three dimensions as well as two dimensions. So just to orient you, you'll be seeing this view throughout. Um, the taller building on the site is the Good Samaritan Medical Center. The restaurant I retail I mentioned uh, are in the, the top of the presentation over to the right. This vacant sort of uh, area is the parking that's associated with um, these uses, but also the site of the MOOC former movie theater. You can see the Harbor One Bank in the foreground here. This is Route 24. Oops, um, this, uh, this white line. Uh, sorry, mouse got a little away from me there. You can see some of the existing multifamily buildings along the far right here, and then the two medical office buildings in the center. And then on the other side of Oak Street from those multifamily buildings is some of the existing single family. There is a church right here, just on the corner of Oak Street and uh, where Route 21 crosses. And then uh, to the near ground on um, uh, the left is Westgate Mall on the other side of Route 24. So we looked at three scenarios during this process. Uh, one scenario, the scenario I'm going to show you today is a phase scenario. So you'll see phases 1A, 1B, and 1C. Uh, we think that this is the most likely scenario over the kind of the 20-year life of the plan, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through it. We also looked at scenarios two and three, which were two alternates for a full build-out. However, the market conditions for scenario one are such that without certain changes, and we'll talk about those in the recommendations, these conditions are already unlikely to happen, certainly in the near term. Some of them may not happen until 
something like 10 plus years. Uh, we felt that scenarios two and three, which we investigated as a full build out, were very, very unlikely to happen in the near term. So they were useful for our study to see what could happen, but they're not going forward as part of this master plan. So development scenario 1A, um, the genesis, as you may remember from the presentation in October, was really to look at life sciences in Brockton coming out of the MIT study that students at DUSP, the, the urban planning uh, program, had uh, considered uh, both Brockton and Worcester. And so that was the genesis of it. So scenario 1A reflects that. It looks at the site of the former movie theater as a potential new life sciences manufacturing area. And the market study indicated that there was a potential for Broughton to become a leader in that, given existing life sciences components, including Good Samaritan, including your excellent STEM program at the high school, and the thought of more life sciences manufacturing working its way down the Route 24 corridor. There's already some. So this scenario responds to that by adding that manufacturing building and also looking at additional office and lab. And if you remember the um, um, uh, projection for office and lab or office alone was not strong initially, but we think given um, the presence of Good Sam, the presence of the presence of existing medical, including Quest Diagnostics, that that could be possible in the near term. You'll also start to see um, some other possibilities for uses. So. Uh, we looked at, given the existing mixed use across the street from Oak Street, that over time the um, single family homes could translate into a mixed use with retail on the ground floor and residential above. Um, the idea for that was to allow some of the retail and residential that's here now to begin to move closer to the Harbor One Bank, closer to the Good Samaritan Medical Center, in other words, closer to potential clients. Um, one of the things that we heard is from the employee survey is that not a lot of people, not a lot of employees on site are using these because they have to walk to them and the current walking conditions aren't great. It's one of the reasons you'll also see the beginnings of a wider path along Oak Street with trees on both sides to allow for a more comfortable uh, walking experience. You're going to see that expand in the next few scenarios. In three dimensions, this is what it looks like, a three-story building for the office and lab. Most manufacturing buildings are one-story buildings, so you see that um, here. We did talk uh, with our colleagues at Thai and Bond on this project about the likely sizes for a manufacturing building, um, because some of the manufacturing buildings for life sciences are quite large. They're not likely to fit on this site. We're looking at the smaller aspects of life sciences manufacturing. And then here in the yellow and red, you see the mixed use building. As we look at the other scenarios, just remember blue is office and lab, brown is manufacturing, yellow is residential, and red is mixed use. That will help you read the site. And again, you can see that the heights here are responsive to the heights on the other side. And in fact, off this picture, the uh, existing multifamily is in fact even higher than what we're proposing, again, as a development concept here. Now, the second scenario, again, allows us to test uh, the, the concepts of what this would move forward in time. So if you think of scenario uh, 1A as being something in the three to five year range, um, scenario 1B could be in the uh, five to 10 year range. So you see here, we're adding more manufacturing. We're uh, increasing the mixed use along here, again, as a test to see what would happen to the site. Um, allowing more mixed use here allows much, if not all, of the existing retail and restaurant to move into either of these buildings, or we've suggested uh, two restaurant pads here. Now you start to see that path I mentioned earlier gets to be expanded because we now have more uh, development happening on site, that development, the value of that is captured, allows us to extend the improvements, not just along Oak Street and Oak Street Extension, but further into the site. So this scenario keeps the manufacturing in the office that you saw before, adds new manufacturing, adds these restaurant pads with potential outdoor eating, which obviously has become extremely popular uh, during the pandemic is one of the positive things that's likely to last for us. And then these connecting trails through a daylighted brook, 
um, and some restored wetlands. At the moment, when Lovett Brook comes onto our site, it actually comes underneath the building. The 7-Eleven building, which also contains a laundromat, is in fact over Lovett Brook. It's channelized through here, so it and the wetlands really aren't working together. Um, in scenario 1B, we start to see the ability to further address that and make it much more of a natural resource for both the existing residents um, and potential new residents and new employees. In three dimensions, you see, again, here's the office and the manufacturing from 1A, new manufacturing here. You start to see the trees coming in, the new mixed use um, uh, buildings, the new restaurant pads. I should add, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, that the existence of more uses on site allows us to put a traffic signal in plan. You see it at Lendl Avenue. Now, Newland Avenue and Lendl Avenue are both paper streets. Um, they've been in existence as paper streets at least since the 1930s. They've never actually been built out. So right now, um, Harbor One Bank employees go out through a driveway that passes past the church properties. Um, in this scenario, we would be able to create Lindell Avenue, signalize it, and that would allow for um, uh, traffic movements here. And Dan will talk more about that as we get to um, uh, a more detailed slide on that. So 1C, and this would be 10 to 20 years or possibly plus, adds just another office lab here. You can see that um, adds a few more amenities for the existing medical office in this area, a little plaza area there. Uh, thinks about part, we think about um, additional parking in this area here. The addition of the office lab also allows us to continue the rest of the street trees along Oak Street and Oak Street Extension. So we're able to take the development on this site and start think about how does that impact the existing neighborhood on the other side. So in addition to creating a nice walking trails in this site for everybody, this is all would all be publicly accessible, we're able to um, add additional trees on the other side, making for a much more pleasant environment for people coming across. Again, you see the signalization there. Um, and again, something that Dan will talk about is uh, improvements along this entire area and into this intersection that could happen as we contemplate more development in this area. You get to see it again in three dimensions. So it just adds this existing office building back in to really connect Harbor One and the medical office building at that point. And again, this would be 10 years out. So we use scenarios to, to, to test what is possible. We know from our market studies that without changes um, uh, in policy and uh, without significant marketing, that we're unlikely to see any of this happen. The, the market demand studies that RKG did were built on uh, an extrapolation of past trends, but there is the opportunity with the state's focus on life sciences, with the city's focus on those and also on housing to really rethink how this could be an amenity for uh, existing employers, existing businesses, and future employers and businesses, as well as existing residentials nearby and um, in the area. In this, we see uh, what the change in demand would look like. So the change in square footage, if you start out with the existing conditions, this is over time what we're showing. Again, we're not expecting all of that to be absorbed immediately. Scenario 1A would be a three to five year scenario, 1B five to 10, and 1C 10 plus. And that relies on the physical improvements coming in, the public infrastructure improvements coming in, and change in market values uh, and demand over time based on the changes in policy. So the benefits we see are primarily initially jobs for Brockton residents going in with the um, uh, the new manufacturing and the new office and lab. And thus, with those jobs going in, also an increase in the ta commercial tax base and therefore revenue for the city. We see traffic improvements coming in in scenarios 1B and 1C because that's where the development that's coming in can pay, start to pay for those traffic improvements. 
um, 1B and 1C also start really creating new locations for the existing businesses. One of the things that we've noticed is that most of them are not actually visible from either North Pearl Street or Oak Street. People have to know that they exist in order to come there, uh, to, to come to those businesses. With the addition of uh, mixed use right along Oak Street, those businesses would now be far more visible to uh, both their existing patrons and new clients and customers. Um, it also opens up outdoor dining opportunities near the brook uh, with Plaza, so it's a much nicer space. Most of the, there's three restaurants on that space now, in that area now. They don't have the ability to do outdoor dining in um, an attractive fashion. Creates new recreational areas for residents and employees that I've talked about, and it improves safety. One of the things that we heard in um, the uh, uh, online surveys was that people were deeply concerned about traffic, but they were also concerned about walking and biking safety and also physical safety. Um, with the jumble of buildings there, uh, it's not particularly well lit. Uh, people were concerned about their safety there or reorganizing the buildings, um, adding lighting, adding uh, uh, accessible pathways really addresses that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan to talk a little bit about the traffic improvements and including uh, access management. So Dan. All right, thank you, Emily, I appreciate it. Um, so there was a traffic analysis that was completed. The study area intersections included Route 27 or Reynolds Highway at North Pearl Street, the Good Samaritan West entrance on North Pearl Street, Oak Street extension at North Pearl Street, River Road at North Pearl Street, and the North Driveway for Good Sam. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2021 traffic volumes were collected uh, due to the pandemic, they were calibrated against historic volumes available from MassDOT and other sources. Uh, analysis was completed and found that the intersections and approaches generally operated an access at an acceptable level of service D or better, uh, with a few exceptions. One was the Oak Street extension and North Pearl Street intersection uh, operated a level of service F in the AM and PM peak. Uh, and the other was the uh, West entrance to Good Sam, uh, vehicles taking a left out of Good Sam in the PM peak, uh, experienced level service E. Now looking ahead, we put out a seven year horizon and did a 2028 no build analysis, which looks ahead to see what traffic conditions might look like if the project does not happen. Uh, a 1% annual growth rate was included in that. And uh, the they, they stayed pretty much the same. They were close to the same with the exception that the westbound movement out of Good Sam went from a level of service E to a level of service F. And the, uh, the intersection of Oak Street and North Pearl Street, you know, fell a little bit worse. Um, so the recommendations in the analysis basically were that uh, as the project develops and as the area is redeveloped, the Pearl at Oak Street extension intersection should be improved and expanded to include turn lanes. Um, as Emily suggested, the signalization of Lindahl Ave and Oak Extension, if that parcel in that area gets developed as it looks like it may be. And then signal and intersection improvements at the Westerly Side Drive and the North Side Drive, as well as pedestrian improvements to Oak and Oak Street Extension Corridor. Uh, what this slide shows in the top image is the, uh, the black bars represent existing driveways or curb cut openings. And there are existing 17 driveways or roads where cars enter and exit Oak Street, uh, creating conflict with other vehicles, creating conflict with, that, with pedestrians that might be attempting to, uh, to walk down Oak Street extension to Oak Street. Um, the lower image shows that uh, with access management implementation, <clears throat> we can reduce those conflict points. We can reduce the number of points by which vehicles are entering or exiting uh, Oak Street. We've brought that down to a uh, number of seven. And again, much of the traffic can be routed through the, the Lindahl Avenue intersection, which may be signalized and uh, fewer conflict points along the corridor. The other thing Emily pointed out was that uh, this also provides you the opportunity to provide a more continuous pedestrian walkway and you know, bordered by trees and, and trees between the pedestrian and the vehicular traffic is something that improves the level of service for pedestrians. Um, 
exactly what the improvements at the Oak Street extension and North Pearl Street and other intersections might look like would be dependent upon an eventual um, build analysis, um, which would be done in the next phase once we have a clearer picture of what exactly the development of the site would look like. Um, so that's pretty much the, uh, the traffic analysis in a, in a nutshell. And I'll send it back to Emily. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. So I also wanted to uh, zoom in a little bit on the uh, proposed amenities for the site. So uh, looking here, uh, you can see that wider sidewalk with the trees on either side, that's that yellow pathway. This is really focused on those two um, uh, retail pads or restaurant pads. Um, with plazas for outdoor dining. You can see Lovett Brook coming through. Again, uh, so, uh, right about here-ish is roughly where the existing 7-Eleven building is uh, with the laundromat in it. And then these yellow walking trails that would be in through this restored area. And I, I talked about the fact that this would be uh, a much better environment for, as I said, existing and um, future residents, employees, uh, businesses. Um, but it's also important to note that uh, adding trees, uh, adding more green to this area, removing some of the invasive species, daylighting the brook, uh, considering the wetlands is really important to address the environmental health of the area and also to address climate change. Uh, brooks such as Lovett Brook and their associated wetlands are very useful for stormwater management, um, preventing flooding. Uh, so, you know, trying to daylight those and restore them to their natural functions is really important. And of course, street trees to reduce the impact of the heat island effect on the local residents, make it much more attractive to get physical activity uh, is important as well. So really these become amenities that attract employers to the site because they know that there's a place that's attractive to employees. And of course, it's great to have for residents. Now, when people start to see conceptual plans and they see 3D blocks, they get worried that there are projects that are going to happen very soon. So I just want to reinforce that this is a, is a, um, a land use plan for the site. It tells us the direction we'd like to go in. Um, uh, you know, any land use will tell a community um, the direction they would like to go in for this area. Um, at, but it's not a specific project that's going to happen immediately. There's a lot of things that have to happen in place for even one of these buildings to uh, come through. And that's where the recommendations of this land use plan come in. So the first is continuing to reach out to critical partners. So thinking about the life sciences community in terms of developers, brokers, uh, companies, employees, workers, uh, reaching out to all of those people, thinking about what's going on in the downtown. Uh, so the focus of the MIT study was initially on the downtown. There are buildings available there that would be perfect for startups where Lovett Brook area could be an expansion site. So thinking about how that strategy would play out and then really thinking about the training and workforce needs for the residents of Brockton and what needs to happen there in order to ensure that there's a solid employee base to attract employees. Players. And as I said, your, your STEM program in your high school gets rave reviews uh, for already having that in place. Then in terms of thinking about new development, thinking about who those critical partners are and engaging them, using the components of this land use plan to market properties, to market the idea and the area to companies. Um, so that you know they get interested and involved. And you, we've heard a couple of things through the grapevine um, that there could be some interest in terms of the uh, working group that we, that we had. Um, thinking about, uh, and our main next step uh, at this point is an urban renewal plan that would allow the uh, Brockton Redevelopment Authority to have some of the tools that are necessary for the site to address the vacancy of the, um, uh, and particularly of the site that had the movie theater on it, but also this uh, ability to do the public infrastructure improvements that we um, uh, uh, showed you on this plan. Um, and thinking about the design standards for any future build here and uh, zoning changes that would be necessary to implement it. 
thus changing the zoning. Uh, another recommendation to allow for those uses that we see are appropriate for the site and creating a district improvement financing program. I mentioned the idea of capturing the value from new buildings, from new development, and then spreading that out, not just to the site, but into the neighborhood itself. A district improvement financing plan would assist with that. Talked a little bit about the projects for daylighting Lovett Brook, developing those pathways, including wayfinding signage and informational signage, uh, so people know what they're looking at, thinking about the habitat of the area, uh, and restoring the wetlands and developing a revegetation plan. And then finally, as Dan mentioned uh, earlier, the idea of a transportation improvement plan, figuring out how best to address. And I and I just want to stress how much we heard from people that they were concerned about existing traffic problems in the area, never mind adding new development. In our case, we're recommending that the plan be done so that the new development can help mitigate um, uh, any uh, potential problems and thinking about the um, uh, appropriate changes that could help uh, reduce those the existing conflicts and any future conflicts. And that would include, by the way, evaluating the existing bus routes, some of which come to the uh, to the site and connections to the commuter rail to try and create incentives for people to take commuter rail. Maybe there's a shuttle that the employees sponsor. Maybe we improve some bicycle connections so that new development does not necessarily automatically mean new cars for every single person involved. So with that, um, obviously, uh, as Rob mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, or the beginning of this uh, presentation, you're uh, wanting to collect some more feedback, which we strongly uh, uh, recommend. Um, and you'd be coming back to this in February once you've um, uh, made a decision one way, uh, or your, your decision on this plan, if you have any changes. Um, the next stage that we anticipate is the development of that urban renewal plan, which would not kick off until uh, later. I just want to stress with that that the state requires additional public participation. And so uh, what we would be uh, considering, we've already discussed, is should that part go forward, that phase two go forward, um, we would be meeting with the business owners. Um, we would be uh, meeting with uh, residents of the area. There would be some additional sort of general public meetings about the process so that I want to just stress that the public engagement doesn't stop with the development of this land use plan. It goes into the urban renewal plan as well. Um, and we are crossing our fingers that um, uh, the pandemic um, will be at a state where maybe we can have some of those meetings in person. So because uh, it's nice to have while, it, while the Zoom has worked well for getting some people who might not be able to come to physical meetings. It's nice to add the physical meetings to the mix if we can do it. So with that, I'll stop share and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, again, for uh, it, if we would take um, questions from the board first, um, we would appreciate that. And then we'll open it up to um, the attendees. And again, if you're an attendee and would like to um, ask a question, please use the raise your hand function. So if you um, hover your, your cursor down at the bottom of your screen, you should have a, a option for raise your, raise your hands. There's also a Q and A option, uh, in which I will read your question into um, uh, the record. And then um, also, if you're on phone, uh, if you press star nine, I'm told that opens up uh, uh, is the same as raising your hand uh, on clicking. So um, I would ask if the board has any questions. I know this is not the first time that you have seen this. Um, but if the board has any other questions before we open up to the public. Yeah, Rob, I, I have a question. Uh, assuming everything, you know, goes in that direction where, you know, we vote on it, we move forward, we get public input, we move forward. Uh, in a perfect scenario, when would you see that first development starting with a timeline? Like, when would that be from, say, right now? Um, I think that there is a good chance um, that our partners at... Um, uh, good Sam 
would be interested in in something in the next 18 months. Um, I know they are interested in making some new investments in the hospital, and this could fit very well into their um, their strategy. Um, as regards to the manufacturing um, facility, that is going to take a, a land acquisition strategy. Obviously, we don't own that. Uh, the BRA does not own that yet. But um, we need to um, also market the site. And uh, we have a strong relationship right now with Mass Development and with the Mass Life Science Center. So uh, I think we could see something, you know, certainly in the 18 months to three years, fingers crossed. We're not an area that is known for life sciences. Um, however, we do have life sciences here. Uh, it, it's one of those hidden little secrets. Um, so if we call on those businesses that are here now to learn about what their expansion plans are and um, look at similar businesses and other communities, we might be able to attract them, their expansions into Brockton, into these spaces. If we have this, the plan, if we have the zoning, if we have the land, if we have the incentives, if we have the infrastructure. So this is a, a long build, long story, sorry. I should also add to that um, and back to the idea of these being conceptual plans is that we use the, the plan view and the 3D view to test how the buildings would fit on the site. It doesn't necessarily mean that buildings will be built in exactly those positions and exactly those uses. What we wanted to know is how would those uses live together on the site? What is a reasonable dimension for the different types of uses? Office dimensions are different from manufacturing dimensions are different from mixed use div uh, um, dimensions. So these are ways, and that's one of the reasons we did um, uh, scenarios two and three is to test different positions. Um, we'd actually looked at a scenario that flipped it and had the mixed use where the manufacturing is and the manufacturing where we're showing the mixed use. So this is one way of doing it, but it's not necessarily precisely how it will happen. What we wanted to know in the land use plan is how do, how, how do those uses live together and what are the public amenities and where could they go that come out of that? I guess I have another question. Um, as far as the downtown um, tools from the state, uh, are any of those transferable to a project like this, which is, you know, basically on the edge of Stoughton? Um, would the land acquisition techniques be applicable from the state or anything like that? Um, yes, this area um, would qualify for a, a series of, of state incentives, everything from um, uh, Mass Works, which is an infrastructure um, uh, granting uh, authority. Uh, it also would apply for what they call EDIP, and I think that's ED Economic Development Incentive Program, which are state tax credits for development. Uh, there are special bio uh, incentives. Um, the state has a workforce training program that uh, we are qualified for, and um, there's there's other um, credits and incentives that uh, we would certainly make available uh, uh, for to attract development. Awesome. Hi, Emily. Um, really quickly, please. So I noticed on one of those plans um, that there was a brook sort of running through what is now 7-Eleven in the laundromat. Um, and then there will be a path. Is that a walking path? And will that area be sort of you know, green or can you just kind of go over that one more time? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So that's the vision is that um, by moving the 7-Eleven um, and the laundromat, and again, we're hoping that many, if not all of these uses could actually stay on the site, they'd just be moved around, that we would be able to daylight love at Brooks so that when it comes under the road, um, it can open up and, and people realize that there's a brook there. It was interesting, the number of people who didn't know um, uh, that it was there and then um, where possible it could be moved out of its channels and that there would be walking paths along it 
um, some of the wetlands would be restored. Some of where the brook is, people aren't going to go. There's a lot of wooded area kind of beyond Good Sam um, that, you know, people aren't necessarily going to walk all the way down that and we wouldn't encourage them to, but we'd like a network of paths that people would have access to. Um, and there's a possibility that there could be either easements or some of that could end up being public property, um, as Rob mentioned about the, um, uh, the acquisition process. So a combination of those to make sure that that was a community asset. Thank you. You're very welcome. Naturally landscaped and maintained. Yes, Open and space. lighting. Um, we talked about lighting. We talked about that wayfinding signage. Um, you know, we, we heard obviously that there are people concerned that it was already a wooded area. Maybe they didn't feel comfortable in that area now. Uh, we also heard somebody used to go and fish in Lobbett Brook and he was certainly interested. I think it was a he, I wasn't positive, could have been yeah, a she. Be. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, that they would uh, be interested in seeing that possibility again, so. Any other board questions before I open it up to the public? Okay, with that, I am going to unlock Paul's microphone. So Paul, you can unmute yourself and uh, you are free to walk about the country or ask can questions. You, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanted to take another look at, at one of the slides in the beginning. And it might have, might have been the third or fourth slide down the bottom of it, it had parking spaces. Yes, I'm just pulling it up. Just one moment. Um, tell me if this is looking, let's see, one, two, three, four. Is this looking right? You're getting there, I think. Okay. Keep going. It actually had like a, like a, a chart and a list of oh a chart oh, okay. there you go right oh there. this wasn't parking spaces this is square footage of oh sorry parking space is down at the very bottom. At the bottom yes yes right. yes yes right so right now you're counting um 1846 parking spaces in the area as it is right at the moment correct yes yes okay and so eventually that's going to go up that would go up about two about yeah. 200 and then another 200 or so or almost three and then another 300. So that's, that's, that's what I was, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of, I guess, emphasize the fact that if there are traffic conditions now, which you've, which you've acknowledged and pointed out that um, that need to be resolved as you go through all of these scenarios, mm -hmm. um, you know, going up by about 40% of parking spaces that are available in the area probably means going up about 40% of the traffic problems and the number of cars, um, even though they're, they're, there's always hope that people would bicycle and take buses and that sort of thing. Um, the worst case would be everybody drives a car and um, it just sounds like it would be a, uh, a bit of an issue <laughs> that would need to definitely be addressed because of the uh, the, the scenarios that are there now in the various intersections and um, the very high possibility of worsening those scenarios with that kind of an increase in the number of cars in and out of the area every day, especially in peak times. So that, that, that's all I wanted to point out and ask about. I think it's an important question, Paul. Um, you know, it, it's been a concern we've heard throughout this process, and I don't expect that concern to go away. Um, and it's one of the reasons, as, as Dan mentioned, for the requirement for a, a study to figure out, you know, as, as different projects come online, figuring out the impact of the individual project, as well as the collective projects. I think it's also um, important to note, you know, we can, we can, Create the biking, we can create the, the shuttle and the transportation links. That's not going to take care of all of the cars. And also recognizing that um, uh, how people travel is very much changing in ways that we can't completely predict. So this idea of autonomous vehicles, 
um, which, you know, if you'd asked us all 20 years ago, um, we'd all think was a pipe dream and sometimes uh, seems to be happening faster than uh, any of us expected. Um, the ride sharing that's coming through, um, you know, so there's a lot of factors coming in here that need to be taken into account kind of at every stage of development. So uh, sure. I'm glad you brought that up in this conversation. You know, ideal situation, some of the people living in the, the mixed use buildings are also working on site. Worst case, you're absolutely right, it's individual cars and it's where do we strike the balance between that ideal, you know, hope and, um, and making sure that the reality is not that worst case scenario. And one of the things about uh, improving the walkability of the site, as we were doing uh, the survey work, uh, people from uh, Good Sam or from Harbor One would talk about, you know, running over to Dunkin' Donuts, but they would have to get into their car to do that. It wasn't a, a pleasant walk. And so by creating more of a neighborhood feel, I think that uh, some of that, you know, traffic issue uh, will, will be mitigated. Not all of it, but it, it's... Uh, uh, certainly an opportunity to, to look into that and to fix some things um, and have them paid for by development is, um, you know, a way that we want to go. If I could just throw in another couple, couple thoughts is with travel demand management, you know, a couple other concepts that could work particularly well with light manufacturing is the idea of potentially having a shuttle that runs from downtown, you know, from the commuter rail to bring people to and from work. Uh, staggered work hours where the facility runs their operations with the intention of their peak not coinciding with the the peak travel on the main roadways around the night, around the site. So there are several things that can be implemented in order to help to mitigate that. In addition to the you know predicted improvements to the adjacent intersections. I just had another couple of thoughts uh, or just observations, I guess, on this chart. It, it looks like the um, the retail restaurant. Uh, I'm assuming that's square footage, maybe. Yes, um, that's correct. Is going from sixty-seven thousand square feet to eight thousand square feet. So where where are those going to go? <laughs> So that's the additional, um, I thought, you know what, I had it on another slide. Oh, so let me, really? That is in addition. Now the parking is not in addition. That's okay. straight up, but the square footage is the additional square Oh, footage. it's just additive. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. And so the church is going away. Well, in the Maybe. test concepts, yeah, yeah. because we were trying to see what would happen, but, you know, the church could well stay in, um, you know, in, in the next stage, that that would be up to them and uh, their discussions with any okay. future use. So, all right, just want to be sure I understand that, Chuck. Thank yeah, you. And, and thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to just note that these are test scenarios for possibilities. Yeah, um, I think it's more important to understand. So, I appreciate that opportunity. May, Thanks, may I ask? May I ask? Oh, one more question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, on the long-term build-out, is there any consideration? I know how you had, you're starting to um, go over to the other side of the sidewalk, making Oak Street very walkable, double trees, all that, uh, which looks very good. Is there any consideration to kind of expanding that to kind of head down to DW and connect the walking space to, to DW Field Park? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, we hadn't considered that in this scenario, but we might, um, Rob, maybe we take a look at how that how that could work at, uh, in the next stages. Um, yes, uh, the city does have a complete streets plan um, and the um, Campanelli Industrial uh, Drive and Oak Street is one of those intersections that we want to redevelop. And I could certainly see um, improvements made, um, you know, from Route 24 all the way over to there um, and improving the walkability, especially since there's so many residential um, uh, units over in that area. And then expand, uh, expanding east on Oak, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a nice tie-in, considering you do have a population that's utilizing that park already. Um, it might just 
kind of have a nice flow to it and, and be more attractive to those that do want to bike and those, you know, not, not risk their lives. Yeah, those would be improvements that we could uh, hopefully put into Mayor Sullivan's new capital budget, um, which hopefully will not be delayed by COVID this year. <laughs> Very good. Oh, sorry, I have a quick question or like kind of suggestion. So, um, so uh, I see that like there are a lot of surface parking area. It's like half of the site is almost covered with like paved surfaces. So, um, can we like uh, can we think about um, like a parking structure or underground parking short of a thing so that we can avoid that kind of you know um, surface parking and that will definitely gonna reduce the heat island effect right Emily could you pull up um, the the schematic for 1c yes and then I would definitely like to address both of those. Hang on, I'm just coming up right now. Sure thing. Yes. Uh, the next, uh, the actual, the aerial. The aerial, yeah. There, yeah. So um, you see the new office building square um, there, and there's a large field of parking behind it. That could be discussed as uh, a future parking structure and eliminating some of the on-street or uh, surface parking. Um, that might be an arrangement uh, that works well for the hospital. Um, likewise, in front of the medical center, um, right there, oh, right there, uh, is another potential location for structured parking, working with the hospital. Um, and that would, that would certainly create more developable space. And I think Emily is going to talk about the topography and the cost. So I don't I want to steal her. Was. <laughs> I'm not going to steal her thunder, but let, let's have her go through that. So we did actually in um, scenarios two and three, which, which, as I said, didn't make it in, we looked at putting in parking garages um, that would actually allow development to creep up. So there's, there's a significant slope change here. Um, it's one of the reasons that you don't see us putting a lot of buildings up here because the cost to do that um, is really high. So if all of this happened and if the market value is such, you could see some buildings moving up and taking, as Harbor One does, um, advantage of the visibility from Route 24, um, uh, in which case parking garages would be needed. The reason that you don't see them on here is because the difference uh, of, of plain surface parking space we usually use $8,000 um, in cost for uh, per parking space for just a paved parking space. It's $30,000. Um, we used to use $25,000. Dan, I don't know if you're using higher than $30,000 now for an estimate, but what I do conceptual oh, estimates, yeah. uh, I use about a th standard $30,000 per parking space. And so in the initial pro formas that we did, this amount of development at the current construction cost and value that they would get isn't enough to justify surface parking. I tend to agree with you. Um, there's also a possibility that, you know, it would certainly address the heat island effect. It would add either more developable space or more green space, but it's not cost effective and the topography is part of that issue at this point. Another possibility would be to make some of the office lab or, or even the mixed use, you could consider podium parking there. In terms of the mixed use, you'd lose the green area on the side because obviously you'd have car access under there. Um, and you know you could potentially put it under here. And that's where you're starting to get into really thinking about pro formas at a much more specific level than is required by a land use plan at sort of this level of mm -hmm. planning. So, um, but but that's to answer your reasons. It's like there's there's really good reasons to do surface parking, but the physical and economic conditions aren't there at this stage. They might be there at a later date. But I, I did want to point out that through our scenario planning, we kind of had that thought in the back of our mm -hmm. head, where could this happen, um, you know, as, as we head down that direction. 
And of course, we might all have uh, self-driving cars by then that uh, uh, go off and park themselves somewhere. Um, and we don't need that much parking to begin with. The nice thing about flat surface parking is that it can always be changed into something else at a future date. So, you know, any one of these areas, as Rob mentioned, could, um, if needed, become a parking structure, uh, you know, if the economics work out for that at a later date. So you're not losing by doing the surface parking now. It can also be restored to green area if you don't need it for some reason. <laughs> Big fan of green. And how uh, is there... the slope happening uh, right now? Like it's from north to south or east to west? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. The slope. Um, oh, the um, it is from Route 24, sort of down, going north and north and west, basically. Um, I don't, unfortunately, let me just flip through quickly. I don't have a topographical map, but there is yeah, one. It goes on the from plan. southeast to northwest. Yeah. Okay. As you can imagine, Good Samaritan kind of sits on a hill. Oh, okay. You know, it slopes down to Oak Street from there. It's great for skateboarding. Rob, <laughs> just, Rob, just a side note. Larry lost power. He's trying to log in if, if uh, you see him trying to get back in. Okay. I think some other people have lost power also. Um, are there any other attendees who would like to ask questions? Please um, use the raise your hand function or press... Um, star nine if you're on the telephone. And then you can also use the Q&A um, question and answers. We're also keeping this open. Um, so if you want to submit uh, emails to planning at cobma.us. And I have a uh, caller on the phone and um, caller on the phone, I'm going to unlock you but if you would please identify yourself um, so we know for the meeting minutes who we're speaking with, I'd appreciate it. So caller, you my, are- My online. name is Janice Lannon. I'm, I'm on 802 Oak Street. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't join by Zoom. I tried logging in, but I couldn't get in. Um, Yes, um, I'm still, I'm just wondering if we're going to get like some type of notices when all this starts really coming to fruition, um, besides just having the meetings and, you know, as soon as we hear, are we going to be hearing something or getting something in the mail to when this is going to be starting? Are, are you talking about construction starting or Correct. the next Correct. phase of planning? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would think that there would be a lot more public meetings and notice um, okay. once we get closer to a public stage. Um, certainly, um, we're going to be working with the new ward counselor, Tom Minicello. Um, yes. He just took um, took office this Monday. Yes, I voted for him. <laughs> Hey, good. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, as projects pop up, we'll be looking yeah. at them as individual projects and there's gonna be much more participation as we go on piece by piece. This is kind of setting the tablecloth. And then when each um, guest sits down, we'll then have um, detailed conversations about those guests. Okay. That's a, that good, sticking, yeah. sticking with my mm -hmm. dinner metaphor. metaphor. Yes. Um, so you will be having, um, hopefully we'll have some in-person meetings soon. <laughs> oh God, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> that would be really good. Yeah. Okay. Thank Definitely. you very Thank much. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Um, and Lisa, I am going to unlock you. Oops. Oh, actually, Lisa, I am going to have to move you to a panelist temporarily, and that will unlock your, um, you have an older version of Zoom. So you should be as a panelist now. 
Um, Lisa, if you want to unlock your microphone. And there we go. Sorry about that. I, I must need to update my uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom app. Anyhow, I, I guess after that last caller, how much of this is conceptual? Is all of this conceptual? Are there any manufacturers or drug pharmaceuticals or offices or multifamilies on board at all? Or is this just a big plan that we're hoping will happen someday? Um, I would say that we're at the setting the table stage. Um, there are some uh, development opportunities with Good Samaritan um, and, and we certainly want to explore those, but um, we need to have, you know, the plan and the zoning and all of those things kind of in place before we go out and start shopping. But it's not as if we have somebody, you know, in mind that we're going to talk to. Uh, and as soon as this is passed, they're going to, you know, this whole thing's going to explode. Um, it, it's going to be a long process uh, to get this going because the the Brockton is kind of a hidden gem on the life science um, scene. We have these firms here, but you wouldn't know that they're here, uh, you know, it, unless you had done some 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 studies. Actually, the MIT study that uh, was done for the Mass Life Science Center and Mass Development identified firms that. We had no idea we're here because you know they're under different trade names, um, but they're here. We've got a great STEM program at Brockton High School, um, and it just kind of makes sense to work with the businesses that we have to help them grow, to create more jobs for Brockton residents. And you need to kind of have a place for them to go in order to do that. So it's it's setting the table. Sure, but nobody's on board yet. And will no, there be like a marketing plan? Is, uh, are we going to reach out to these businesses and ask them to come here? Or is it just, you know, we're gonna hope somebody will come by? Well, actually, um, if this plan is approved in February, um, our hope is to um, then begin another round of planning, but we also have brought on a, uh, a professional, a senior planner, uh, John Fay, uh, who is an MIT graduate and actually worked with the group that developed the original plan. And he's in my office now, we're doing some uh, industrial analysis and we plan on actually going and creating a uh, Brocken Life Science Council so to bring all those CEOs and plant managers that we already have in Brockton together, and we then start developing a plan on how they can expand and how they can bring their customers into Brockton. So that's that's phase two A. Phase two A. <laughs> um, no, I just wondered because I agree with you, Brockton is a hidden gem. And if things are done right, this could be a great city. It's never made sense why things are the way they are. And I've got to say, with the ceiling fan behind you, you get this. Nope, I know. Halo. You get a halo <laughs> over your head. Here, let me switch here. There we go. Is that better? Uh, here. <laughs> uh, a little bit better. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> there, that might be a little better. So the halo's less, gone. A little less angelic, yes. <laughs> Should I have horns? <laughs> anyway. Lisa, one of the things that we did to um, the, the consulting team is structure the land use plan so the city could use it as a marketing document. So you've seen the brief presentation and I should say, I will put up at the end um, the website, but the full land use plan has a lot of the information that developers would be looking for in it. And it's specifically so the city can take it and say, here, we have a plan that we're working on um, to, uh, to make this Come happen. Come check us out. Exactly. 
Exactly. Okay. No, it's a great step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And actually, Rob, um, I'm just going to share the website real quick while you load up any do. other questions. And if there are any other questions, uh, we're wrapping up at an hour right now. Um, that is the website where we're running the project on. And of course, uh, you can send any questions via email to planning at cobma.us. And uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading a note. Oh, yes. And, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll read those comments into the record. And hopefully on uh, Thursday, uh, February, uh, the February board meeting, we will be adopting this plan. So I want to thank you all for participating uh, this evening and uh, being a part of Brockton's future. So with that, um, I think Madam Chair got disconnected. So if Larry would entertain from a board member a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? I'll take that over. I'm not a board member. Go ahead. Uh, it looks like the motion carried. Thank you very much, people. Have a great thank evening. You. And thank, uh, thank you. Enjoy little Christmas tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you.